16 October 1963. Mother says, listen to this. O death, thou speakest truth, but truth that slays. I answer to thee with the truth that saves. It's beautiful. So the materialist, O death, thou speakest truth, what can he reply? It's the truth. 27 November 1963, written by the mother at the beginning of a notebook containing quotations from Sri Aurobindo's Savitri. Some ac extracts from Savitri, that marvelous prophetic poem which will be humanity's guide towards its future realization. 27 November 1963. It's like in Savitri when he speaks of the consciousness that fell asleep in the dust. The divine consciousness that fell asleep in the dust of its creation. I am embroidering. The divine consciousness, the eternal mother that is, fell asleep in the dust of her creation. Somebody wakes her up and she realizes, this isn't from Sri Aurobindo, she realizes, laughing, that it's the Supreme Lord who shook her. So she does everything, all sorts of extraordinary things, anything to stop him from going away. The mother takes up savagery. She reposes motionless in its dust of sleep. Then, for him, she leaped forth from the unseen vasts to move here in a, in a stark, unconscious world. And then, in beauty, she treasures the sunlight of his smile. Ashamed of her rich cosmic poverty. Splendid. And woos his large-eyed wandering thoughts to dwell in figures of her million impulsed force, only to attract her veiled companion and keep him close to her breast in her world cloak, lest from her arms he turn to his formless peace, is her heart's business and her clinging care. 7 December 1963. Then the entire world, the universe, appeared to me in that light. And at every point, which takes up no space, at every point of the universe and throughout the universe, it's that way. Not that there are far and near places in the universe. That's not what I mean. It's beyond space. But there is a whole hierarchy of nearness up to something that doesn't feel and doesn't know. It's not that it is outside, because nothing can be outside the Lord. But it is as if the extreme limit, so far away, so far, so far, absolutely black, that he seems not to reach there. It was a very total vision and such an acute experience that it seemed to be the only true thing. It didn't take up any space, yet there was that sensation of nearness and farness. And there was a kind of focus or a center. I can't say, but it was everywhere which was the climax of thee, purely thee. 
and it had a quality of its own. Then it began to move farther and farther away, which produced a kind of mixture with something that was nothing, that didn't exist, but that altered the vibration, the intensity, which made it move farther and farther away to darkness, unconscious darkness. And something kept coming again and again to me. There is no other sin. Because this followed a few lines I read in Savitri on the glorification of sin in the vital world. The words came to me because of that. There is no other sin, no other vice, than to be far from thee. It seemed to explain everything. 31st December 1963 All earth shall be the Spirit's manifest home. Is it the promise that came? Yes, the promise of the G. The G always promises. All can be done if the God touch is there. There. All can be done. All. In Savitri, Sri Aurobindo went through all the worlds. And it so happens that I am following that without knowing it. Because I never remember, thank God. I really thank heaven. I asked the Lord to take away my mental memory, and he took it away entirely, so I am not weighed down. But I follow that description in Savitri without mentally knowing the sequence of the worlds. And these last few days, I was in that muddle of falsehood. I told you last time, it was really painful, and I was tracking it down to the most tenuous vibrations, those that go back to the origin, to the moment when truth could turn into falsehood, how it all happened. And it is so tenuous, almost imperceptible, that deformation, the original deformation, that you tend to lose heart and you think it's still really quite easy to topple over. The slightest thing and you can still topple over into falsehood, into deformation. And yesterday I had in my hands a passage from Savitri that was brought to me. It's a marvel but it's so sad, so miserable. Oh, I could have cried. I don't easily cry. The world grew full of menacing energies. And wherever turned for help or hope his eyes, in field and house, in street and camp and mart. He met the prowl and stealthy come and go of armed, disquieting, bodied influences. A march of goddess figures, dark and nude, alarmed the air with grandiose unease. Appalling footsteps drew invisibly near. Shapes that were threats invaded the dreamlight. And ominous beings passed him on the road, whose very gaze was a calamity. A charm and sweetness, sudden 
and formidable, faces that raised alluring lips and eyes, approached him armed with beauty like a snare, but hid a fatal meaning in each line and could, in a moment, dangerously change. But he alone discerned that screened attack. It makes you wonder. It's like something gluey surrounding you, touching you all over. You can't go forward. You can't do anything without encountering those black and gluey fingers of falsehood. It was a very painful impression. And last night, there was the answer, as it were. This morning, when I got up, I didn't remember clearly, but in the middle of the night, I knew it very well. It is, it's not going from sleep to the waking consciousness. It is coming out of one state to enter into another one. And when I came out of that state to enter the so-called normal one, I remembered very well. I was as if made to live the way of turning that falsehood into truth. And it was so joyful, so joyful, in the sense that it's a vibration similar to joy that is capable of dissolving and overcoming the vibration of falsehood. That was very important. It isn't effort. It isn't righteousness or scruple or rigidity. None of that. None of that has any effect on that sadness. It is a sadness of falsehood. It's something so sad, so helpless, so miserable, so miserable. And only a vibration of joy can change it. It was a vibration that flowed like silvery water. It rippled and flowed like silvery water. Which means that austerity, asceticism, even an intense and stern aspiration, all sternness, all that, no action, no action, falsehood stays put in the background. But it cannot resist the sparkling of joy. It's interesting. And in his text, Sri Aurobindo says that the Lord joins the contraries, the opposites, puts them together so they fight each other, and that this will and action give him a sardonic smile. I am commenting. A tract he reached, unbuilt, and owned by none. There all could enter, but none stay for long. It was a no-man's land of evil air, a crowded neighborhood without one home, a borderland between, a borderland between the world and hell. There, unreality was nature's lord. It was a space where nothing could be true, for nothing was what it had claimed to be. A high appearance wrapped a spacious void, yet nothing would confess its own pretense, even to itself in the ambiguous heart. A vast deception was the law of things. Only by that deception they could live. An unsubstantial nihil guaranteed 
the falsehood of the forms this nature took, and made them seem a while to be and live. A borrowed magic drew them from the void. They took a shape and stuff that was not theirs, and showed a color that they could not keep. Mirrors to a phantasm of reality. Each rainbow brilliance was a splendid lie. A beauty unreal graced a glamour face. Nothing could be relied on to remain. Joy nurtured tears, and good and evil proved. But never out of evil one plucked good. Love ended early in hate. Delight killed with pain. Truth into falsity grew, and death ruled life. A power that laughed at the mischief, mischief, excuse me, a power that laughed at the mischief of the world, an irony that joined the world's contraries and flung them into each other's arms to strive, put a sardonic rictus on God's face. I was asked for an illustration for Huta. I saw the image, the Lord's face with a sardonic smile, and then, after last, last night's experience, this morning, suddenly that expression of the face changed, and I saw the image of the true, the true sorrow of compassion. I don't know how to explain it. The sardonic smile changed. From sardonic, it grew bitter. From bitter, it grew sorrowful. From sorrowful, it grew full of an extraordinary compassion. So we could say that falsehood is the sorrow of the Lord, and that his joy is the cure for all falsehood. Sorrow had to be expressed so as to be erased from the creation. And sorrow is falsehood. The Lord's sorrow, sorrow in its essence, is falsehood. So to live in falsehood is to hurt the Lord. It opens up horizons, and his joy is the cure for everything. That's the problem seen from the other angle. So if we love the Lord, we cannot give him cause for sorrow, and necessarily we emerge from falsehood and enter joy. That's what I saw last night. It was all silvery, all silvery, silvery. There was even the vision of how the vibrations were in the cells, vibrations that were silvery, Vibrations that were silvery, sparkling, rippling, but very regular and precise. How can I put it? It was the contradiction of falsehood in the cells, like little flashes of silvery light. But that falsehood is the great obstacle, the extreme difficulty. It's something gluey which entered the creation and sticks to everything, and which has become a material habit too, 
because it's not only mind that has falsehood in it. There's falsehood in life, in life itself, in the completely inanimate, I don't know, maybe it came with life. According to Savitri, the origin of falsehood lies in life. But it's as though unconsciousness, in order to go towards consciousness, to return to consciousness, had taken the path of falsehood and death instead of the path of truth. And falsehood is this, the sorrow of the Lord. I was asked for a message for next year, and things of that sort kept coming to me, so I didn't say anything. They wouldn't even understand. It's incomprehensible if you don't have the experience. And if you say just like that, almost dogmatically, falsehood is the sorrow of the Lord, it doesn't mean anything. Or if you say it in a literary way, it's no longer true. And if you said falsehood is the Lord's way of being unhappy, the mother laughs. People would think you're not being serious. 